And we preach that. We love, we love the, the cross and the preaching of the cross. A lot of churches have kind of abandoned that. They don't preach about the blood. They don't, they, they don't preach about uh, man's need of salvation. And I hope that uh, you as a church will never tolerate anyone in this pulpit that doesn't believe that. Long after we're gone, if the Lord should tarry, make sure you always have a preacher that believes in the power of of the cross and the power of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to preach this morning on uh, God's four calls on man. God's four calls on man. And uh, as uh, Pastor was sharing a few moments ago, uh, I really firmly, uh, I know you believe that, and we've, we've always believed that here, and uh, that uh, God calls people to salvation. He calls you from a lost condition out there in the world to uh, find salvation and, and understand the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, am I up, Mr. Mark, behind me? I can't see. Yes. There it goes. We're good. All right. You got, he's got, I've got him a good backup today. If, if this breaks down, he's got me on, my, on PowerPoint, so he won't lose me back there. But uh, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, if you want to turn there for a moment, Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, you might recall the story of how the federal head of the human race, the number one human man made upon that planet Earth, made a bad decision. He chose to go against the Lord. He chose to sin in a perfect environment. He chose to break the one rule God had for him not to disobey. And he chose out of deference to uh, be with his wife rather than have fellowship with God. He chose to break that rule. And he, and he ate that fruit along with Eve. A lot of people blame Eve but the Bible holds Adam accountable for the sin of humankind. See, it was, uh, we can't blame the women, fellas. We always say it was her fault. She calls, she, if I just had a better wife. No, it's not that. It's us. Falls back on us, gentlemen. We're responsible. The Bible says in Genesis 3, 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Adam, where are you? <laughs> Adam, where art thou? You see, Adam had walked with God every day of his life after creation. Every single day, God would come down and they would walk together and talk together. And even after he was created, they would have a fellowship time in which God would come and walk with them in that beautiful garden. And yet, God came for his appointment with them that day and they were nowhere to be found. They were hiding, hiding behind the bushes. And, and God called Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Can any of you remember what Adam said? What was Adam's response? We can't come out. We're naked. <laughs> God says, duh. I made you naked. You know, what, what's the deal here? <laughs> I made you that way. You know, we, we were ashamed. You see, the choice Adam brought when he sinned, I mean, the, the, the ramifications of that choice were shame and guilt and separation from a, from a God that loves us very much. And as we think about God's four calls on man today, I want you to think about the fact that uh, God's first call was the call of salvation. Adam was in a, in a lost condition once he made that, that choice. And the Word of God uh, says that God's call goes out to all human beings. And we used to sing the song when we were little in Sunday school, red and yellow, black and white. What's the rest of it? They are precious. Jesus loves who? All the little children of the world. He loves human beings and he wants to save human beings. And God's call of salvation went out a long time ago to all human beings. It goes out to every human being. Red and yellow, black, white, no matter what nation you come from, what color you are, God's call goes out to you. The Word of God says so plainly in, in John 4.14. It says... 1 John 4, 14, we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. See, we are lost without Christ. Without Him, you know, and if He doesn't save us we're, and we die, we're going to go to hell. We have no, no, no destination but an eternity without God in hell if we don't receive this salvation and, and God issues that call of salvation. See, we're lost without Christ and on our way to hell. And if He doesn't save us, that's where we're going to end up. We're going to go there. All of you have, have I know you know John 3.16. How many of you know John 3.16? 
Quote it for me. I'm gonna, I took it off the screen because I want you to quote it for me. Go ahead. Let's see it. Let me hear it. I saw a guy the other day after a funeral that didn't, he, he had grown up around church. He, was in, he went to our youth things at Otter Creek. He didn't know what John 3, 16 was. He wasn't a member. He wasn't an attender. His parents didn't take him to church. And he very seldom came after he grew up. But at the funeral, I gave him the red stone. And it had John 3, 16 on it. That Sandy so graciously had a bunch of them. And they engraved John 3, 16 on the little red stone. I said, I want to give you, DJ, a special one. It has John 3, 16 on it. And, and he goes, what does that say? What does that verse say? And I'm thinking to myself, what does that verse say? <laughs> Is there anybody on the earth that didn't know what John 3.16 says? And, and, and the Lord said, oh yeah, a whole lot of people. A whole lot of people. You see, God's call of salvation goes out to the whole world, but a whole lot of people haven't heard it and don't understand it. But verse 17 is, is so good. It says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's neat, isn't it? To think that God calls us to salvation. He, in fact, I was reading in, in my devotional this morning, and, and this uh, author, I'm telling you, this, this just kind of cranked, cranked me up. And uh, it said, faithfully present was the title. It says, our God is the God who follows. Have you sensed Him following you? He's the one who came to seek and to save the lost. Have you sensed Him seeking you? Have you felt... His presence through the kindness of a stranger, through the majesty of a sunset or the majesty of romance, through the question of a child or the commitment of a spouse, through a word well spoken or a touch well timed, have you sensed Him? You see, it's not us looking for God. God looks for us. He comes seeking us. You know, we think, oh, we seek God. And we but No, we never seek God. We always go the other direction and yet God comes seeking us. God gives us Himself. Even when we choose our home and our hovel over His house, and our trash over His grace, still He follows. That's neat, isn't it? Never forcing us, never leaving us, patiently persistent, faithfully present. He uses all His power to convince us that He is who He is, and He can be trusted to lead us home. I was thinking about, uh, I'm writing a, a story this week on, on someone that's very dear to my life and dear to Miss Bonnie's life, and I haven't given any names in my Besides Still Waters yet because I'm saving that until her birthday, which is Thursday then I'll reveal who that is, but I'm giving her life story. And in her life story, she came to a point of, in her life in Orlando, Florida, which they were, they had, nothing had worked out. They had moved to Florida for a job and it fell through and everything was crashing. They were having to move from that place back up north to Gainesville, a place they had never been before. And, and this lady, probably the age of 30 at the time, cried out, looked up to heaven and cried out to the God of heaven and said, God, if there is a God, help me. <laughs> help me. <laughs> you know what? God was already working long before she even called, called on him. She, she already knew his, he already knew her name. He already knew where she was going to be before she got there. And in a hundred miles north of there, God was preparing a little tiny obscure church, a little tiny obscure group of Christians, a little tiny obscure preacher by the name of Gene Keith. Very unknown in the world other than in a in little circle of Gainesville to meet the need of this particular person, this particular lady and her family. And, and the rest is history. And you'll, as you, if you read the, I won't steal the thunder, you have to read the daily devotion to get the answer to who it was and what happened next. But know this for sure. God's first call on every human being is a call of salvation. He wants people to be saved and he wants you to be saved and God wants all humans to be saved, yet many will die lost. Why? Why will they die lost? Why will they die lost? Pardon? They're going to hear in some fashion. Why will they die lost? Why, Steve? Because they will reject what they know. Even the people in the darkest jungles that have never heard the name Jesus, they get, they get light from God. They get revelation from God. And when they respond in a positive way to that general revelation that God gives every human being, so he puts it in us, number one, we know by nature there's a God. And then we look around at nature and we know that it has been created. It didn't just happen. Somebody made that. And it made it. See, when we respond positively to, to that, God moves heaven and hell to get us the rest of the revelation. And see, most of the world 
Most of the world has heard the revelation of what, who Jesus is and what he came to do. There's some that haven't. There's some parts of the world that don't have a, a written language yet and that sort of thing. And In fact, Dr. Jeremiah wrote a wonderful message this morning. If you get a chance to go back and listen to the whole thing, please do so because it was tr tremendous on Turning Point this morning. But he said that this one missionary pilot that would haul supplies to these inner uh, jungle missionaries way back in the middle of nowhere, he had been working on a translation of a, of a Bible all, for years for this one particular area, this one particular language that had never been reached. And in, in, the, in the course of one of his flights, he, he crashed into the mountain and died. And the only thing that survived were a few of his effects. The very natives that he was writing the, language, the Bible for in their language happened to be sifting through the records and they found the book with all his notes in their language. The translation of his Bible into their language. They took it back to their village and they began to follow it. And, and pretty soon the whole village, pretty much 60 to 70% of the village became Christians. The Southern Baptists were going to send mission, a missionary in there to that area to replace it. And when they got there, the people said, yeah, we already know that. <laughs> we already know what you're talking And they go, how do you know? They pulled out that old Bible with those scribbled notes from that missionary pilot that had flown into the hill. They said, because we found the book, this book, and we've been following it ever since. You see, God is the author of salvation, and God's first call is, is salvation. And, and as Miss Ginger says, those that might not have ever heard, there's a God in heaven that cares about human beings, and He's going to make sure they hear. He's going to make sure they get the message about His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Went too far, one. Back up, one. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You see, God loves every human being. He loved Adam and Eve, yet Adam and Eve had a choice. You know, Adam and Eve chose sin over God, and, and yet God in His grace and mercy still reached down and saved old Adam and Eve, and, and He's still saving people today. And the question for you today, are you saved yet? Pastor asked you a few minutes ago if you're saved, yet if you're not, you need, to, you need to come to Christ today before you leave here. God is on your trail. He's been looking for you. And you wonder why things have happened in your life like they've happened. Listen, because the hound of heaven is on your track. <laughs> and he's not going to let go until he finds you and he gives you salvation. And, and if you don't know him today and you're feeling his heart tug on your, your heart's door, you better open that up and you, and come to Christ today because the first call is God's call of salvation. Second call is the call of sanctification. The call of sanctification. Say that word with me. Sanctification. Sounds like a big old giant scary word, doesn't it? But it's not a scary word. To sanctify means to, to set apart, to uh, make holy, to purify, to make sacred. God wants and expects those to, to, who follow Him to start acting like His people. You see, a whole lot of people try to get sanctified before they get saved. Before they have salvation, they want to clean up and, and do better. I'll, I'll turn over a new leaf and I'll, I'll, get, I'll clean myself up and fix my... I'll, I'll clean up my act. And as soon as I clean up my act and I start doing better, then I'll go to church. No! <laughs> you can't do it that way because you and I are incapable of changing on our own. We might do a few nice things and a few good things and we might turn over a, a new leaf but there's a, there's a story in the Bible about a guy that was demon-possessed that cleaned up his act. He didn't get saved. He just decided to do better. And the, the demon left him for a while. And then he came back later and he, he said, wow, this guy, this is a cool place to dwell. So he brought seven demonic spirits back into that same person. And the end result was his life was ten times worse than it was before because he just turned over a new leaf. He didn't get saved. You see, when we come to Christ and we answer that call of salvation... God starts a new thing in us, a process of, of instantaneously saving us. We'll go to heaven when we die. But there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done in the meantime. There's a whole lot of work that needs to be done on us and this nasty here, here and now. How many of you think you still need a little bit of work? I know I do. You know, we each, each and every one of us needs a lot of work. Yeah, we're, we're Christians. We, we clean up nice and, and we talk a little different, you know, but... Well, we're not there yet. And, and I like the little song the kids used to sing, you know, be patient with me, God's not finished with me yet. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. <laughs> Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars and, 
etc., etc. But but he's still working on me, and he's still working on you. You see, the, the process of the call of sanctification is you changing, becoming what God would have you be. Joshua said a long time ago to the children of Israel, right before they were going into the promised land, he says, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. See, they were they were no longer slaves in Egypt, but they weren't in the promised land yet. They had some, they had some, a distance to go and in order to get to the promised land, to, to live in that promised uh, victory and promised wonderful place that God had for them, they had to do some stuff on their own. And part of it was cleaning their life up. And you might recall the story, they got rid of the foreign gods in their, their homes and got rid of all that stuff they, they used to do in Egypt and they, they got themselves right. Uh, they, see, our responsibility after we believe is to allow God to help us clean up our lives. You can't do it on your own, but once you come to Christ and you answer the first call, the call of salvation, God gives you power to help change yourself. You know, in fact, uh, Brother Steve this morning in Sunday school, some great scriptures, jot these scriptures down that uh, we looked at Sunday school. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through, or 12 through, no, 16 through 18, and then Philippians chapter 12, excuse me, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 15. It's terrible when you can't read your own writing, isn't it? Mine, if the ink dries, I have to get. I have to read it before the ink dries sometimes because I, I scribble. I have little scratches there. But 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. Steve, do you have that one right there? Stand up and read that 2 Corinthians passage if you have it. And uh, who has Philippians chapter 2 that would like to read it for me? Who has a New Living Translation? If you have a New Living Translation or something like that, raise your hand for me. You have an Amplified? Okay, if you'll read uh, Philippians 2, 12 through 15 in just a minute. But go ahead and read the... Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, Brother Steve. It says, But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. But the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You see, we're being transformed. We're not there yet. Don't judge me yet because I'm, God's not through. Sometimes when you're looking at a project and, and, when it's, and when it's going on, it don't look so hot. I know if you walked into my, my wife's bathroom a week and a half ago and saw it, you'd have went, ah! Because it was a wreck. And, you know, I started working on it and she'd say, what about this? And I said, honey, wait till it's done. <laughs> you know, what about this? What about I said, honey, wait till it's done. When it's all said and done, if you don't like, we'll fix it then. But, but it, see, you know, in the process, sometimes it doesn't look like very much. And, and it looks like things aren't going to be what you want them to be at the end. But folks, that's how we are. The process of sanctification, God's call of sanctification is God changing us from one thing to another. We're being transformed. What does it say there, sister? Read the last, uh, read the one about work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That, that section. See that? Uh, go ahead and read it, 12 through 15. we got time. Therefore, my dear ones, as you have always obeyed my suggestions, so now not only with the enthusiasm you would show in my presence, but much more because I am absent, work out, cultivate, carry out to the goal and fully complete your own salvation with reverence and awe and trembling, self-distrust, that is, with serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchfulness against temptation, timidly shrinking from whatever might offend God, Amen. You're, you're, the, the power doesn't come from us. The power comes from God to make the changes that He wants us to make. He helps us become what He wants us to be. He helps us change. He helps us quit drinking. He helps us quit running around. He helps us stop cussing. 
He helps us stop doing the things that are wrong and help, He helps us become what we ought to be. And, and it's a process of sanctification. It's a change that's going on when we set ourselves apart and we say, Lord, I really want to be like that. I want to be what you want me to be. And, and as, as our sister read there, we, we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not that we're working for our salvation. We've already got our salvation. What we're doing is we're working out the sanctification part of it because there's a certain amount of work you have to do once we get once you're saved. And part of that is, is obediently following the Lord when He shows you what to do that you do it and you make those changes necessary. You see, the call of sanctification. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, we read uh, verse 25 and 26 all the time. You know, husbands love your wives and even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it that you might, he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Talking about, not about just about marriage, just talking about God and the church and what he does through us. And here's what he, in verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And I was watching that video about the marriage a while ago. I was thinking about this scripture. God was, you know, the, the church... You know, we're, 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 we're taking the elements, celebrating what Jesus did to make us part of the church. And here, this lady is marrying a triple guy that, that has really nothing to offer her. And yet, she loved him so much, she married him and, and made a home with him. And, you know, we're the bride of Christ, and we really don't have much to offer him. <laughs> we're, we're the cripples in, in, in that sense. And God is the, the champion, and, and he loves us, and and he, and he woos us and he draws us to himself and he gives us salvation. And then he make, starts making that change in us and changing us so that we, there won't be any blemish when we get there. I know one thing. I got a few blemishes. Do you? <laughs> See, if we're honest with ourselves, we're a long way from what we ought to be. But you know what? I'm not what I used to be either. Thank God I'm not where I'm not where I want to be. I'm not 100 percent where God wants me to be yet. But thank God I'm not what I used to be either. And that lady I was talking about from Orlando, they used to party hard. They partied. They drank and smoked. Drank and didn't smoke pot because that wasn't even popular in those days. But had it been, they probably would have. But they drank and they partied and and they were in the in the wrong kind of lifestyle. And yet, when she came to Gainesville, some little old. Christians that were just trying their feet and trying to share the gospel, just going out door to door and going in people's homes and trying to do what God told them to do, met this lady that cried out to God and said, God, if there is a God, help me. <laughs> help me. And God sent some tiny Christians. And in reality, we are very tiny, aren't we? Some obscure people to meet the needs of that family. And, and you'll, you'll understand in the weeks to come, in the next three or four days, who that was and what all God did as a result of His wonderful grace, the call of salvation, and then the, the call of sanctification. Then the third call is the call of separation. The call of separation. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You see, there, there are some people and some places that will make you fall if you stay around them. You keep living like that and you don't let the Lord help you become sanctified. See, I don't believe that we reach this point of sinless perfection like some people do. There's some, you know, Pentecostal branch that I have some great loving friends that love Jesus and are Pentecostals and some of their side believe that you reach this point of sinless perfection. You get to the point where you've never sinned on planet Earth again. And, and I don't know that I'll ever reach that. Maybe you will. Maybe you're more spiritual than your pastor. But I don't think I'll ever reach that. Now, on the other side, I will. But here's the deal. There are some things that I know when I started walking with God, I had to quit hanging around and quit doing. And when you really get really serious with God and you really become the sanctified Christian you ought to, do, ought to be, and God begins to work in you and change you, there are some separations that are going to have to occur. There are some places that you used to hang around and people used to hang around you can't hang around with anymore. Uh, in fact, 1 first, first Peter chapter 4, verse 1 says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For the, he that has suffered in the flesh had ceased from sin, that he should no longer 
that he, he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. You see, there's some things that we need to separate from. There's some people that are going to cause you to fall into sin if you hang around them still. There's some people that you used to run with and used to party with. If you continue hanging with them and doing those things, it's going to mess your Christian life up. It won't send you to hell. It won't keep you from going to heaven. But it will keep you from being a sanctified Christian that separated themselves for God's service. And you won't fly as, quite as high as you could fly with the Lord on, on this earth by living that way. You have to separate yourself from, from certain things and certain people. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3 says, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when walked in lasciviousness, lust, excessive wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Steve, look that up for in your living, New Living Translation for me. 1 Peter 4, 3 and 4. And I'm going to have you read it in a minute. This is King James. I want you to hear it in modern English. Verse 4 says, Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Can you read it? Can you read it out loud for them? This is, this is a, a modern English translation. Same verses. Four. They think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation when they keep abuse on, on you. That's first Peter four four. Okay. You don't you don't you don't party with them like you used to. They think it's strange. You think you're weird. Okay. You want five? Uh, go ahead and read five. Amen. Thank you, Steve. When you separate from people, they don't understand it. They think, what is wrong with that person? He's got, he's got religion. Oh, yeah, he's got that Jesus stuff. So he's a religious fanatic. He's a nut. You know, because they think you're, you're weird because you don't smoke pot with them anymore. Don't party with them anymore. You see, the call of separation calls you out of that kind of lifestyle. It calls you to, to living for Christ and into a new mode of thinking and a, and a new way of living. See, you cannot... And will not go higher with God in your spiritual life without separating from evil and evildoers. And that's why it's very important. When you first come to Christ, you need to try to reach every lost friend you have. You need to try to reach all your partying buddies and girlfriends before you get a little further with the Lord. Because the longer you live with Christ, the further you're going to be away from them. And pretty soon, your new friends are going to be here at church. You're not going to have the same friends like you. Not, nothing wrong with loving them and having them as friends, but they're going to pull back from you. They're going to separate from you when they when you go to their house and you're not drinking anymore with them. Oh no, he's a religious fanatic. He's, he doesn't drink. They won't even ask you to the parties after a while. <laughs> so it's critical that you try to reach them with the gospel while you're new, you know, in your faith. Because God's call of separation hits every one of us. There's a time and a place and people that you have to separate from. And a lot of Christians don't, they never become separate Christians. And in fact, the Bible says it's very plain about who you should marry and not marry. Did you know the Bible says you're not to marry an unbeliever? If you're a Christian, you should not marry or date an unbeliever. If you're a Christian businessman, you shouldn't make an alliance or a partnership with a lost person. In this day and time, it's even kind of scary to make it with Christians because a lot of Christians don't have the morals they ought to. Amen? Right. You know, back in the old days, a handshake was, was good enough. Right. This day and time, you better hope, hope you have a, a good contract that a lawyer can uphold in court because even Christians this day and time don't have the morals of days of old. But we need to separate from evil things and evil people. and We need to separate things from our home that are, that are causing us to fall into evil situations. Uh, all through the Bible, there were situations in which they had to take and get the idols out of the home before God could bless those homes. And, and we're a lot like that today. We have to separate from, from evil things. The fourth call is the call of service. The call of service. As you walk with God and you get closer to Him and you separate from evil and you, your life gets closer to, to being like it ought to be and you're, it, it begins to, you begin to, to clean up, so to speak, in your life. You know what happened to that? That lady that uh, called out to Jesus, before, before she met some of the people from the old Southside Church, 
She was into alcohol and cigarettes. In fact, she said she liked cigarettes so much she would, if she ran out, she would find the old butts and smoke them down until there was nothing left. She was just hooked on it and loved it. Loved to party. Loved to, to go to that type of thing. And, but you know what happened? The moment she came to Christ, all that changed. Her desires changed and her life began to change. And, and it wasn't a few short years that this same lady was a church clerk in the old Southside Baptist Church. And it wasn't too long after that that her lost husband came to Christ and he became the song leader of the old Southside Baptist Church. And it wasn't too long after that that the same lady and, and her husband and Miss Carolyn Brewer and a few others formed a singing group. And they began to travel around and sing, for, sing gospel songs to people. And a group that lasted how many years, Miss Brewer? 22 years. 22 years. <laughs> and who would have thought here are these wild people, these partying people from up north somewhere, from obscure people that had never laid eyes on Pastor Gene Keith, and he had never laid eyes on them, and yet the God of heaven was issuing his call behind the scenes like he always has, down through history, and he called them through those three separate calls and ultimately called them to, call number four, the call of service. See, uh, Matthew chapter 22 says, then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which are bidden are, are not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So the servants went out of the highways and, and gathered together as many as they found, both good and bad, and the wedding was furnished with other guests. You see, God calls people like us, people like you, people like me, people like Carolyn Brewer and Steve Carlson and Gene Keith and others, Every Christian is a called Christian. See, the call has gone out in every generation, and you're called to service whether you know you're not, that you know you are or not. Every Christian is called to, to full-time Christian service. See, a lot of people think, oh, if I, would just, if I could just work around a bunch of Christians, I could be in the ministry. No, your job is a ministry. Whatever you're doing, whether it's a, from the dog catcher to the president, whatever your job is out there in the world, secular and sacred, there is no separation. It's all, it's all sacred. It's all dedicated to God. And, and we're called to serve mankind with, a, with a, the love and gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we take, our, we take the message everywhere we go and we invite people to that great party that God's going to have one day. <laughs> I like what Chris Tomlin calls it, God's great dance floor. And there's going to be a party one day soon. <laughs> and there's going to be dancing there. Baptist. Mom and Daddy told us not to dance. We were Baptists. We didn't do any of that kind of stuff, you know. But Mama, you're going to have to put your dance shoes on when we get there, okay? And we're going to have to forget that. We're going to have to get up and dance with the rest of them. And we're going to raise our hands and party around the throne with Jesus because there's a great party going to happen in heaven one day soon. And, and Jesus has called every human being that's a Christian, that calls themselves Christian, that have followed Christ and they follow these, these other three calls. He calls you to a life of service for Him. You see, the fourth call is the call of service. And, and Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He concludes by saying, Lo, I'm with you always, even till the end of the age. You see, the church age is getting ready to come to an end. This time of grace in which God has shown His grace to humankind and, and, and there's been a red carpet rolled out from the, the halls of heaven down to sinful earth. And Jesus has prepared a way for all human beings that, that want to respond to His call. They can be, be, they're going to go to the feast. They're going to get to go to the party. Those that reject it won't get to go. But see, what matters is where are you in this call today? Where, where are you? What part of the call are you in? See, your, your age, your gender doesn't matter. All Christians are called to God's service. And you're somewhere in one of those four calls today. Or maybe your entry level. Maybe you haven't answered the first call. And as, as Pastor Emeritus Gene Key said a while ago, before you leave, turn on the 39th, answer the first call. Come to Christ and ask Jesus to be your Savior and Lord so that you can go to the party one day. But see, each and every one of you is somewhere along that road. See, this Christian life is a long road. I received Christ at the age of 11 a long time ago, or 9 actually. And, uh, but it's been 
from, from the age of nine until now, I'm 61. It's, it's been like this. Now it's been down and up, up and down sometimes, you know. But it's steadily climbing. And one day, I'll step into the other side and I'll get my new body. You know, when I leave here, I get a brand new one. Like you will too, if you know Christ. And, and, I, and all of that I've ever tried to do for him will all be in a history book. See, the books are being written up there, by the way. And, and Hebrews says that he's gonna, one day he's going to open the books. He's going to judge the dead out of the books. You know? The good thing is, ours won't be pass or fail. You know, once you trust Christ and you answer the first call of salvation, see, you've already you passed. You, you're, you've got 100%. Jesus passed for you. You don't have to worry about pass or fail after that. But what you do need to worry about is your, your life of, of the other three calls and what you've done about it and how far you've come with him and how many, uh, how many people you've tried to bring with you. Wouldn't it be terrible to get there and not bring anybody to the party with you? How many of you like parties? How many of you like to have friends around? How many of you like to invite people to your party? Okay, invite some. <laughs> And by some, because because God's call to service means you. It's not don't that's not my brother or my sister. It's me, O oh Lord, as the song says, standing in need of prayer. It's it's all of us. See, it's all of us. It's you being a part. Be a part of, of God's great calls because you're you're one you're one of those calls today. And you know you you figure out which you pick your seat and ride and and move on to the next couple of calls. If you're in the first one, don't stop there. There's a lot more to come. And there's a happy life out there, a fulfilling uh, super life, if you want to call it that way, on this earth. You can have a lot more fun on this, in this earth and in this life if you just get in on God's calls and do what he wants you to do. You'll be surprised what God uses you to do in your life. The little lady that uh, cried out to God from that trailer park in or Orlando, never dreamed, <laughs> never dreamed what God would use her to do she was looking, she left Ohio, an orphan that had been adopted into a family with very little human family, very little love in her life. And she came to Florida looking for love and a family. And when you hear the end of the story, you'll shake your head in amazement and say, what a great God we have. What a great God we have to take people like us and do such things with us and such powerful things in other people's lives. God's four calls on man. Find out where you're at and keep, keep walking forward with the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the book. Your precious word. Oh, Jesus, it's wonderful. We thank you for it. Lord, it's able to protect us. It's able to, to grow us. It's able to comfort us. It's able to make us wise. Lord, it's, it'll never fail Never, not one tiny period or one tiny dot in your word has ever failed or ever will. And we appreciate it so much. Thank you for giving it to us. Lord, I pray that we will be people of the book as long as we live. And Lord, we'll listen and follow your four calls upon our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.